Jackie, you're on the wrong side of the room. Give me over here. I feel like I've got two churches here, the behaved and the disobedient. All right, let's get our Bibles open today to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be picking up in verse 14 today. Luke 11 and verse 14. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us and this opportunity once again to be in your word. And we pray this morning, Lord, that it would be a blessing that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us. We pray also today, Lord, that if there's anybody here that maybe has not asked you into their heart, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And now we give you this time. Speak to each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we left off last time with Jesus being asked to teach his disciples to pray. Now, in that time, in that culture, they would have teachers that people would follow. Most of these teachers would have a, a somewhat of a curriculum, and the people would follow after that person. And it was your responsibility to read and study and learn of their way. Jesus was a very different teacher than the rest Jesus was one that would come to the disciples and he would not only tell them what to do, he would show them what to do. He was an example to them by how he lived before them. Now it kind of blows my mind to think that now the disciples have been with Jesus almost three years now. We're only less than six months away from him going to the cross. And these disciples now finally come to him and say, teach us to pray, not teach us how to pray. So that indicates to us that up to this point, they haven't even taken any time to learn how to pray. Even though Jesus has been with them, he's taught them, he has uh, been there to sleep and to eat and to walk and to journey all over with his disciples. Yet, just now, they're finally asking that question. So the Lord gives them this template of how to formulate their prayers, obviously beginning with remembering who they're praying to. That's something we need to remember also. Now next we see the Lord is still busy in his journey back to Jerusalem here. He's busy healing people, praying for people, doing miracles, and part of that is casting out demons. And that's where we begin our story today. Verse 14, he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. Now, casting out a demon that had caused his victim to be mute Jesus created this real stir among the multitudes. A lot of people were there watching this take place. Now the Jews, the reason for them being marveling at this is the Jews in Jesus' day had their own exorcists and they would see, seek to cast out demons also. But they believed in that culture that they had to make the demon reveal his name or they would have no authority over that demon to be able to cast it out. So according to Jewish thinking of that day, the demon was impossible to cast out because he made the man unable to speak and therefore unable to reveal the name of the demon. So they wouldn't have been able to do that unless they could call the demon by name and make it come out. So right away they marveled at what the Lord was able to do here. So there are three groups of people we're going to look at here. But one we're going to spend a moment on, and the other two we'll spend a little bit more time looking at. First of all, you had a multitude of people who just simply marveled. And so there are people even today, they marvel at the things of the Lord 
doesn't necessarily mean they're committed to him, but they do marvel at the Lord. They say that they believe in him, but not to the point where they truly give their heart over to him. There's a second group that said that they wanted a sign from heaven so that they could believe more. And then there's this other group where Jesus, they believe, was casting demons out under the power of the devil himself. And so the word Beelzebub that's used here, it was one of the names of a Philistine god, Baal. And in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it speaks about this. Baal means Lord, and Zebub means flies. So this literally would be translated Lord of the flies. So here Jesus said, no servant can cast out out of, oh, excuse me, in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. So there's only room for one Lord in your life. Your Lord is the one who sits on the throne of your heart, the one who calls the shots. So the first question we ask ourselves today is, who is the one that sits on the throne of our heart? Who is your Lord today? Now, I don't really like the bumper sticker that reads, God is my co-pilot. Does this person seriously think that they have the ability to co-run their life with God? And oftentimes, that's exactly what they think. They think the throne in their life has a seat for two. God can sit on one, and they can sit on the other one. Well, let me tell you today, if that's your thinking, the Bible tells us that God shares his throne with no one. He is either fully Lord of your life, or he's not. And so we get in trouble, don't we, when oftentimes we try to make decisions for our life ourselves because we want to have some control. We want to run some of our life, and then there are other things we realize that are beyond us, and so we'll let God have that part. That's foolish. God doesn't share his throne with anyone. You either make him the Lord of your life or you're going to have real struggles. And thus, many of us have attempted that and we have had those struggles, haven't we? So who is it for you? If you think his throne is a two-seater, you're very wrong. And you best move out of the cockpit of your plane here that you're trying to fly. Now, the second group just witnessed Jesus casting out demons and making it possible for this man to speak once again and still wants even more evidence that Jesus, who was what he said he was. Now, even today, with all the evidence that we can see of the evidence of Jesus Christ, yet people still want more evidence than that. Well, verse 17 but the Lord, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against its house will fall. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then by whom do your sons cast them out? They had their own exorcists. So how are they doing it then, is what his question is. Therefore, they will be your judges. But I cast out demons with the finger of God. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Speaking of himself. So he addresses the first group. Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter with these people. His first point is that if he is an agent of Satan who is working against Satan, then civil war has broken out in Satan's army and he'll de be defeated. You can't have an army fighting against itself and expect it to stay successful. That just makes sense. But if you're rejecting the truth, then what you end up believing is plain foolishness. It's true that if you don't believe the truth, you'll begin to believe anything. And oftentimes we run into people who believe the most crazy things. They choose to believe that because the alternative means they must believe the truth. And they don't want to do that. So why is what Jesus is doing of the devil and yet what the Jewish exorcist not of the devil? It doesn't even make sense. 
So this group rejected the truth that was before them, and what they did decide to believe was foolishness here. So Jesus nails them by saying he is doing these things by the power of God. Thus, the kingdom of God is before them. And they don't want to see that. That's true for them even today. In the Seder, they make a position for their Lord. And the whole Seder speaks of Christ. And yet, they take that and doesn't even see their Lord before them. That is happening even today. Their own statements show how foolish they were, and they couldn't argue their point any further. You notice the scriptures don't go on to say, and so they debated with Jesus. There was no debate. They had nothing to say. So verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, he says his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted, and he divides his spoils. So now Jesus here paints a picture that the people can understand. He speaks of a man who is strong. We believe this is speaking of the devil himself here. Not only is the devil strong, but he says he also has, he is fully armed. Boy, don't we know that. There are many in Satan's arsenal, many different types of things that he can use to attack you today. He's like a strong man who comes to destroy people's lives and then he watches over his possessions. In other words, he has your heart. Either Christ has your heart or the devil has your heart. And he watches over you and he doesn't want to let go. And many of you who have turned your heart to Jesus Christ, you have found that to be true, that the enemy doesn't give up easily. He'll put anything in your way to be an obstacle to keep you from fully devoting your heart to Jesus Christ. But there is a stronger one than even the devil, and that is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus comes, and we're told he sets people free. So the point with this story is Jesus is not under Satan's power in any way, shape, or form. Jesus didn't have to perform some kind of elaborate rituals like the exorcist would do. He simply told the demon to get out, and the demon left him. Jesus proves that he is stronger than Satan by casting him out of those that the Lord, the Satan had possessed before. Now, in the recent past, we saw that Jesus called first his disciples to go out. He told them to share the gospel, and remember, he told them they could heal and to cast out demons. Then later, there was another 70 that he sent out by two. So there was 35 couples that went out, and they were told to share the gospel and to heal. But they found when they came back, they had stories of how they were even able to given the power to cast demons out of people. So by the power of Jesus Christ, we have the power to even cast out demons. Satan has no power uh, over us who are in Christ Jesus. Paul states in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he, meaning Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. John adds to that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who that is in the world. Satan is not Jesus' equal. When you're filled with the power of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you, you are more powerful than the enemy. Oh, he still roars, I can't imagine what it'd be like in the middle of the night if you're on a safari in Africa and you hear a roar of a lion nearby. You can't see it. You don't know where it is. It would send ice through your veins. That'd be terrifying. And that's what Satan is counting on. He's counting on you thinking he still has power over you when he roars, but that's all he has is a roar. Satan has no power over the believer. None whatsoever. When Jesus brings his light into your life, he is the light of the world, we're told. There is no darkness, and darkness cannot dwell where there is light. Satan has no power over you. As one writer put it, 
Jesus looks at every life delivered from Satan's domination and says, I'm plundering the kingdom of Satan one life at a time. He goes on to say, there's nothing in our life that must stay under Satan's domination. The one who binds a strong man, divides his spoil, is our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Understand, Satan is not the opposite of Jesus Christ. He is not his equal on the dark side. There is no equal in this battle. Jesus is God, the creator of all things. Satan is one of his creations. So when you hear the term, oh, they're going to bring a knife to a gunfighter, they'll bring a gun to a knife fight. Here we're talking about Jesus brings a Sherman tank and you've got nothing but marbles. This isn't anything close to being equal. Jesus is God and he calls the shots, not the enemy. Verse 23, he who is not with me is against me, Jesus said. And he who does not gather, scatters. So make this perfectly clear. I'm not a Christian, but, you know, I do good things. The Bible tells us right here, if you're not with Jesus Christ, if you've not asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, then you are against him. I didn't say that. He is saying it right here. He gives us a choice to make, and there are only two choices here. There's no neutrality here. Thus, we ask the question again, whose side are you on right now? If you're not for Jesus, then he says you're against me. Thus, to be undecided, you are decided, and you're not for the Lord. And for those who like to sit on the fence in regards to their faith, here you're being told you can't do that. You're either on one side or the other. Not because I said so again, but because the Word of God says so. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So notice, if you're not with Jesus, you are the enemy. Jesus can change all that. When you become his, then he gives you victory over that life of sin. G. Campbell Morgan says, he puts it in perspective by saying, there's only two forces that are at work in the world, the gathering and the scattering. Whoever does the one contradicts the other. Again, he asks, what side are you on? Going on, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, finding none. And he says, well, I will return back to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. But look what takes place in verse 26. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, even more wicked than himself, and they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Oh, how sad it is when someone has a demon cast out of them and then do nothing more with it. Then you're an empty house, so to speak. Your heart is empty. So if you don't fill it with Jesus Christ, then it will. that demon can see that your house has been cleaned up. But now he can come back in and he'll bring seven spirits even more wicked than him to come into your heart and occupy you. It's better to have one than eight. And so the point here is you need to fill that spot in your heart with something. You need to fill it with Jesus Christ because it's either you're controlled by the enemy or you're controlled by the Lord. Demons want a place to inhabit. They want living creatures, not dead things. So I wonder if this isn't going to be a bit of a warning to this man who had just had this mute uh, demon cast out of him. It doesn't say that immediately he accepted Jesus Christ. It just says that the demon was cast out of him. So here's a warning to that man. You need to do something with this. You need to receive Jesus Christ. (coughs) Excuse me. Or you have that opportunity of that demon coming back in and bringing others with him. Not a good place for you to be. And so this man, whom the Lord 
cast out the demon was cleaned up. He's been set free from this demonic possession, and yet there's that void that he needs, that vacuum in him that needs to be filled. Because demons want that living body to inhabit. So something has to fill that part of the man's heart. Your heart must be filled with something. You need to decide what that's going to be. I look back now before I was saved and I realized I tried to fill my heart with many things. It could be relationships. I had girlfriends and all of that. Drinking, partying, buds. All of those things that we all probably fill our hearts with. But there was still this emptiness. I knew there was something lacking in my life. And when I came to Jesus Christ, that part of my heart was finally filled. Oh, what a joyous moment that was to feel fulfilled. So many people today are walking around with that hole in their heart. They're unfulfilled. Well, verse 27, it happened as he spoke these things. There was a certain woman from the crowd who raised up her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So here this woman in the crowd is blown away by what she's seen with Jesus and begins to think that it's all caused by his mother. She was someone special. Well, it's possible that this is an early attempt by someone to begin Mary worship. That would be just what the enemy would want you to do. Find some other excuse rather than accepting Jesus Christ. So pay attention to Jesus' response here. He doesn't say bad things about his mom at all. He had nothing bad to say about her. But he takes this opportunity to point out that there are things that are even more blessed than Mary. Some people pray to Mary. Some people have things in their home, statues and things of Mary. But the Lord shows us here there are things that are far more important than that. Yeah, rise up and call Mary a blessed, a blessed lady. But even more so are those who have received Jesus Christ. So even back then, there were those who wanted to begin to worship Mary. But Jesus gets this lady refocused and says that all are blessed, who hear the word of God and do the word of God. The book of James, James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, to hear the word of God, and join a church, start tithing, you can memorize a few verses, all of that kind of stuff. But the Lord says the application of the word is what's important. You can't just go to church. You can't just tithe. You can't just become a member, go to catechisms and thus. There's more to it than that. The Lord wants you to act upon the things that you learn in the Word of God. It doesn't matter how much of the Word of God you hear. The Pharisees heard a lot of the Word of God and knew the Word of God. It has to be that simple application. Live what you say you believe. So God means what he says, and he says what he means. Don't try to reinterpret it to make it say what you want. Believe what the word says and obey it. So two things you must do here. Hear or read the word of God and then correctly apply the word of God. Now, according to William Barclay, who is quite a historian, about 15 years after Jesus' time on the earth, a man by the Thidius arose among the Jews and claimed to be the Messiah. He persuaded people to follow him with a promise that he too was going to part the Jordan River. He tried, of course, and he failed. All the people were there that were following him. They thought he was the Messiah, but he couldn't do what he promised. Now the Romans didn't want this kind of stuff going on, so they dealt severely with him. He knew what kind of sign the people wanted to see. And Jesus told us that hearing and keeping the word are more important than these signs that you're looking for. Several years ago, there was a thing called the Toronto Blessing. And many people came from all over the world to Toronto, spent lots of money 
so that they could get this fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. And they spent some people a lot of money to get this blessing. Didn't come. Then years after that, there was a Kansas City prophets. And people came from all over the world to Kansas City. I, I've heard the story. I don't know if it's true, but the pastor out of Vineyard out here was one of those that went to Kansas City and, and attempted uh, to get a, be a part of all of that. And he himself admits that was all phony. He pulled out of all that. Praise the Lord. But there are people looking for these signs and these wonders, living from one to another. Another year came several years later in Florida. They had another uprising of a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. Once again, people came from all over the United States, all over the world. Even pastors went down there to receive this fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. And it didn't happen. And so that fell apart. So hear the word. Keep the word. That's what's important. Now, verse 29, while the crowds were thickly gathered together, you're talking a lot of people here, Jesus began to say, this is an evil generation. Boy, if there was ever a scripture for today, listen to this. This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign's going to be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, one greater than Solomon who is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, once again, one that is greater than Jonah is here. And so a large crowd had continued to gather around the area. And the Lord points out to them, verse 30, that Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites. So also the Son of Man will be to that generation. Now the city of Nineveh is the city of Mosul today in Iraq. <clears throat> Jonah was a man who was told by God to go into Nineveh and preach. And the Ninevites, they were a brutal people. They were known for their lawlessness. Read the book of Jonah and it tells the story. Jonah knew that the Lord was going to have compassion on these wicked people and he wanted them all destroyed. And he knew the Lord would have compassion and mercy on them and he didn't want that. He wanted them killed. So Jonah boarded a ship and headed in the exact opposite direction, attempting to run from God. Anybody, maybe it may not have been a ship, but how many of us have attempted to run from God? And God responded to Jonah's disobedience by sending a storm out in the water where the ship was. Finally, Jonah admitted, this whole storm, it's all about me. So in loving compassion, they threw him overboard. And the storm calmed down. But in the meantime, Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. He spent three days, does this sound like a man, ladies? Three days in the belly of a whale or a fish of some kind and would not repent. Men are stubborn, aren't they? Oh, you're not too much better. But here he finally, after spending this time in the belly of a stinky old fish, he finally repents. And when the, the fish spit him back on the shore, guess where he was? Many of us have experienced this also. He was right back where he began. And that's what God will do with us. As we rebel, we go through this journey, and some of us think we're so far away, and yet it's one step back, isn't it? It just takes one step to come back to Christ when you've gone on this journey. And here he was back at Nineveh. And he goes into Nineveh, and I love the preaching that he does here. This is a, a perfect uh, example of how to preach the Word of God here. Billy Graham should have taken note from him. Greg Laurie, Franklin Graham, Rabbi Zacharias, all these great preachers. This is what they should do. Here's his message. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. That's it. That's all he said to them. Can you imagine? And the whole city repented. Exactly what he didn't want to see happen. 
So the sign of Jonah to the people of Nineveh was him having come out of the belly of the fish to tell them that there's going to be judgment coming. Now in a similar way, Jesus is the sign to these people by dying on the cross, being buried in the grave, and in three days he rose again. And the message is going to be repent or judgment is coming upon you. And yet the Jews refused to believe and they still refuse to believe. Now, fortunately, the Bible tells us there will be a time when the Jews will have their eyes open and they will come in masses to accept Jesus Christ finally. But right now, they're still in darkness and they still refuse to believe. Next, Jesus speaks here of the Queen of the South. This would be the Queen of Sheba. The story is found in 1 Kings chapter 10. Now, the Queen of Sheba was powerful. She was very wealthy and she heard about this man Solomon and traveled great distances, we're told, just to see if the stories were true about this man's wisdom. And when she met Solomon, she was blown away with his great wisdom. So it was well worth the trip for her to find out who this man Solomon was. So Jesus' point with this story is, if this woman went to great lengths to hear Solomon how much more should the people of this generation be coming to Jesus, not just to hear him, but to realize that he is Solomon's creator? How much more should they receive Christ and what his words were? So it's amazing that both the, the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba were both Gentiles. Did you know that? So Gentiles are accepting these things that the Jews were not. Does that not sound appropriate? This is exactly what was going on and is still going on. Jesus then warns these people, I want you to understand, verse 32, the men of Nineveh are going to rise up in the judgment with this generation and they will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. How much more are we going to be held accountable after we've heard the preaching of Jesus Christ and we reject him, when the, the, the men of Nineveh, heathen dogs, lawless people, terrible people, repented just at yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown, spoken by a man that smelled like fish. And so we're going to be held accountable. Some of us will give interesting excuses on that judgment day as to why we can't do what Jesus is asking us to do, why we can't receive him. Some will blame their upbringing. I wonder if maybe Greg Glory will be called to the witness stand to tell of how he responded to God at a young age, even though his mother was an alcoholic and married seven times. If someone had an excuse, there you go. And yet he came to Christ. I think of Corey Tim Boom. She'll be called to share her life in a Nazi a concentration camp <clears throat> after having her whole family killed for their faith, all because her whole family were Christians trying to help the persecuted Jews. Those who reject Christ are going to be judged for their rejecting. There is no excuse. When you're a little child, you may have your excuses, but you're a grown-up now. You know better. Quit using your past as an excuse for ill behavior. Quit using your past as an excuse as to why you think you can't follow the directions that Jesus gives you, beginning with receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Now, at first we might think there's no connection here, but let's look at verse 33 to 36. <clears throat> no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but they'll put it on a lampstand that those who come may See the light. The lamp is the body, uh, excuse me, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. 
So, as I say, we might think, well, this is disconnected from the previous verses. But there is a vital link here. Jesus reminds us here that no one puts a lamp that's lit under some kind of a basket and hides it. Imagine at nighttime, you turn your lights on to dry, but I'm going to put a blanket over the lights. That's foolishness. You wouldn't turn the lights on at all if you wanted it dark. But if you turn them on, then you want to be able to see. You want the room lit. So you'll naturally put a light on a stand of some kind so it will light the room. So the application here is God is the one who has lit that lamp in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He provided a blaze of illumination for the whole world to see. If anyone doesn't see that light, it isn't God's fault. He has shined it. You have to reject that light. You have to refuse that light. Now, back in chapter 8, Jesus was speaking of the responsibility of those who were already his disciples to let that light shine. In other words, to share their faith and not hide it under any kind of a vessel. <clears throat> Here, he's exposing those of unbelief of his sign-seeking critics here. The lamp of the body is the eye. Even as a bad eye will make a person blind, so a bad heart's going to make a person spiritually blind. One must be spiritually blind to attribute Jesus' miracles to Satan and to ignore the work of Jesus right before their very eyes to live as a hypocrite. I want you to mark in your Bibles 1 Corinthians 2.14 or put it down on a paper and look at it later. It says the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. Here's what's really important. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So if you have a friend or a family member you've been witnessing to and you want so badly for them to understand and they don't, understand they can't. They can't. If they're blind, could you imagine going to someone and saying, isn't Niagara Falls beautiful? They have no eyesight. They can hear the sound of the water and imagine, but they cannot see. So the non-believers, it's their choice to not believe what Jesus Christ offers to him because the Bible tells us that God desires that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. So he gives that opportunity to give sight to the blind. And there are those who refuse that. They don't want that. And thus, they walk in blindness through this world. And they will be held accountable for that. So the lamp of the body is the eye. So when one lives in darkness, there are two possible reasons why. One, there's no light source. And two... Even if there is a light source, there is a darkness within that person. They can't receive it. So someone that doesn't have Jesus Christ, they cannot see because they're in darkness. They're, in, they're blind. So the media knows that. And if they can catch your eye, they have you. So they advertise these things under the best of circumstances. I have to laugh because... The other day I saw this commercial, I believe it was for Burger King, and they have this beautiful hamburger. Of course, the patties are about four inches thick, and they're not really, but they make them out to be hot sandwiches and, and fresh lettuce and tomatoes, and you see all of that in the picture. You get it, and it looked like somebody was back there blind putting your hamburger together. It's all smashed. They stepped on it a few times before they gave it to you. And you go, what? This doesn't look anything like it. But see, they win you over with those pictures. That's how they sell cars. That's how they sell clothes and all of these things because they appeal to your eye. And this is what they do. Thus, they sell these things in the best possible scenario. Try to fill yourself with the things of God. And as you do, you will be that light to a world that's in darkness, shining bright for Jesus. Now he goes on, verse 37, as he spoke, there was a certain Pharisee who asked him to come and dine with him. So he did go. He went and sat down to eat. Now when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. I love this about Jesus. This Pharisee invites him to come to dinner 
And he didn't think, even think much about it. He just went. He knew that this religious leader was opposed to all that he was saying and doing. And as Jesus came in, it says in verse 38, when the Pharisees saw, he marveled. He was surprised that Jesus would actually come and have dinner with him. But he also noticed that Jesus didn't first wash his hands before dinner. Now, don't come to the conclusion that Jesus was eating with dirty hands. That's not what this is speaking of here. Luke is speaking of a rigid ceremonial hand washing that was done before they ate. A Jew would do this. And Jesus didn't follow their rules and regulations that a good rabbi would follow. And it seems like this Pharisee was a little put off by this. Why was he so upset? Well, John Trapp tells us the, this the Pharisees deemed as a great sin as if to commit even fornication. That's how bad this sin would have been. And that's why he was so upset with Jesus. William Barclay further explains, described how special stone vessels of water would be kept because of ordinary water wouldn't be ceremonial clean. So they'd keep this water in a special vessel. I mean, this is real sparkless water here. In performing the ceremonial washing, one started with at least enough of this water to fill one and a half eggshells. One began by pouring the water over his hands, starting at the fingers and running down towards the wrist. So hands up. And then each palm would be cleansed by rubbing the fist into the other hand. Water was poured over the hands again, this time from the wrists to the fingers, so your arms would be down. A really strict Jew would do this not only before the meal, but would do it between each course of the meal. And so a rabbi who once failed to do this was excommunicated. He was thrown out because he failed to do this. This is an important thing for a rabbi particularly. Another rabbi who had been imprisoned by the Romans for some infraction <clears throat> says that he used this ration of water he was given for ceremonial cleansing instead of drinking, and he nearly died of thirst, but being regarded as a great hero by the other rabbis to make that sacrifice. So the problem for these religious leaders, and many today, is that they're more concerned about these rituals than they were about having their hearts cleaned. Jesus isn't concerned about your rituals. How long do you go to church? Some churches will have services for two and a half, three hours long. Imagine. Don't you ever complain about me. <laughs> People think you've got to do all these little acts of rituals to get God to be happy with you. And so thus they had looked to outwardly things instead of inwardly. And their hearts, it says, were far from God. So they believed that their outward actions gave them the right then, as many of these Pharisees would do. They would go out and live terrible lives, not doing what they were supposed to do. Kind of that thing of do as I say, not as I do. And thinking that these rituals would somehow appeal to the Lord and give them permission. God is looking for a clean heart, people. God is looking for you to not hear the word alone, but to obey it. That's what cleanses us, the word of God. I'm going to stop here today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, for what it speaks to us today. And I want to pray right now, Lord, that if there is anybody here that has heard this word and maybe they've never really given their heart over to Jesus Christ, that right now you would empower them to do that, Lord. So if this is speaking to you this morning, while everyone's praying, heads are bowed, you don't need to be looking around. If this is speaking to you, you want to receive Jesus Christ, you're in sin. He's not going to be your co-pilot. It's time for you to relinquish that throne of your heart over to Jesus Christ. If that's speaking to you, raise up your hand and I'll pray with you right now that you can give your heart completely to Jesus Christ. Don't play games with this. Anybody here this morning, raise up your hand and I'll pray with you. Well, 
Oh, Lord, then we thank you for your word. Now empower us, Lord, by your spirit to not hear it alone, but to go out and live it, Lord. Let our light shine in such a way that it would draw other non-believers to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand.